everyone has a story. Some stories are intertwined. This is ours. My name is David. Two weeks after my 13th birthday, my mother killed herself. She had attempted suicide several times before. Seared into my memory are disturbing images I've tried to forget. My father breaking down the front door to our house after she swallowed a bottle of pills. Puddles of bright red blood on the bathroom floor after she slashed her wrists. On the day of her death, from the moment I opened my eyes, I was consumed by a strange sense of foreboding, a knot in the stomach feeling I'd never experienced before nor since. Before that day ended, I realized that the dark sensation was warning me that something terrible had happened, something that was about to change me and life as I knew it in ways I couldn't possibly imagine. For years afterward, I had nobody to talk to who had even an inkling of what it's like to be left behind that way. I felt lost. I felt abandoned. Most of all, I felt alone. Until an overcast March morning in Maryland, five years later. My name is Rick. I was 14 when my mother killed herself. My sister and I waited in the car in the garage next to the downtown hotel where mom had taken what dad referred to as a short vacation. Dad went in to get her, leaving us in the white Rambler station wagon. For the longest time, neither of them showed up. I kept my sister occupied. We talked, told stories, played games. A stranger suddenly appeared and told us dad would be with us shortly. But more time passed and my nerves signaled something was terribly wrong. I tried to keep my sister and my mind occupied until I finally saw dad walking toward us, his head bowed and inexplicably our rabbi was by his side. Seconds later, I burst into tears. For years after that terrible day, I felt trapped in a dense fog my sister, brother, and I, and our father had no extended family around us and no close friends. I felt alone until an overcast March morning in Maryland, two and a half years later. Now I'm 17. It's March of my senior year, and my family and I just moved back to Maryland. I'm standing on a street corner waiting for the school bus. Hey, buddy, you're going to Deval High? Yeah. Wrong corner. Over here. <laughs> well, that's how David and I met. He must have thought I was a real idiot. <laughs> well, maybe a little. But it didn't last long. Because it didn't take us long to realize just how much we had in common. Both born in New York City. Both moved around a lot as kids, both rabid baseball fans, both, both sons of suicide. Both sons of suicide. Once we discovered we'd experienced the same crushing tragedy, the floodgates opened. Finally, after years of being silent and holding it all in, we each had someone we felt comfortable confiding in. Someone who got what it was like to be left behind by the person who was supposed to love us the most. Someone who understood the need to continually ask the unanswerable question, why? And someone who shared the desperate feeling of being all alone. We hadn't been able to talk to our fathers they were lost in their own grief and confusion. And they, like most people at the time, believed it was a sign of weakness for men 
or boys for that matter, to dwell on or express their honest feelings. Real men were expected and still are to be stoic, buck up, push through it. But ignoring or denying those deep seated emotions, that can be harmful, self-destructive, even dangerous. Neither of our dads ever uttered the word suicide. The stigma associated with suicide was so pervasive that my dad called an Air Force buddy who was editor of our local newspaper and pleaded with him not to refer to the cause of death in any articles or obituaries. Uh, David, you had trouble saying the word too, didn't you? I sure did and still do. A few weeks after the funeral, I was starting eighth grade at a new school. My homeroom teacher was filling out the standard paperwork on the new kid. So of course, she eventually asked if my mother stayed at home or went to work. I froze, but she insisted. So I blurted, she died. How she wanted to know. My mouth open, but nothing came out. It, it's okay, she said. You can tell me. Suicide, I heard myself whisper seconds later, for the first time since it happened. And then reality came crashing down on me. After our mother's suicides, our families were shattered and would never be the same. Each of our maternal grandmothers blamed our fathers. My grandmother cut off her relationship with my dad and all three of his children, and I lost that whole side of my family. And my grandmother vindictively refused to include the word wife on my mother's gravestone. When our mothers died, each of us took refuge inside ourselves. Yet that's precisely when we most needed to share our feelings, our fears, our uncertainties, so they wouldn't fester and grow to consume us. We needed to share the weighty burden with someone else, someone who would listen without judging or shower us with pity. That's what we found in one another. And the more we listened, the more we were willing to share and the more we heard ourselves say out loud what we'd only been able to think. Opening up, truly opening up, was vital to us eventually coming to terms with our loss and starting to heal, an ongoing process still. We each felt enormous relief the first time we shared our secret <laughs> Once we started talking, we couldn't stop. Sometimes at David's house, sometimes at mine, often on long walks or on a park bench, we'd bear our souls to each other. Now we were no longer alone. We were 17 when we met. We're in our 70s now. We became friends, brothers really, when we discovered we shared the unthinkable. We've stayed close through all the decades, even though we've usually lived in different states and different time zones. We've married, had children and grandchildren, enjoyed successful careers, traveled the world often together with our wives, and we've made many other friends, some close, but none as close as the two of us. Our mother's death and particularly how they died, influenced who we've become and how we've lived our lives. But their suicides do not define us. We rarely spoke about our mothers except with each other for most of our lives. But two years ago, we felt pulled to raise awareness of and help ease the stigma around suicide. So we overcame our reluctance and went public with our story in a memoir about the profound loss we experience and the healing power of our friendship. Since then, we've written op-ed essays, participated in webinars and podcasts, and given talks. 
We want those who lose someone in this way to understand that they are not alone. And we want to encourage those struggling with traumatic loss to talk frankly with someone they trust. That's especially true for men and boys who are culturally conditioned to suppress their emotions. Talking candidly can ease the pain and lift the burden. And we've come to realize that there's a big and growing universe of people who have also lost someone to suicide. Sadly, some of you are in that group. The numbers are sobering. Nearly 50,000 people die by suicide every year in the United States. Seem inconceivable? Well, think about this. There are more than five suicides every hour of every day. So in the 15 minutes you're listening to the two of us, at least one more life will be lost to suicide. Alarmingly, suicide is the second leading cause of death among people under 45, second only to accidents. And clearly each suicide alters many lives. Stop and think of all those who are left behind, the mothers and fathers, the sisters and brothers, the aunts and uncles, the friends and coworkers, the daughters and the sons of suicide. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University found that children and teens who lose a parent to suicide are particularly affected and at greater risk. They are three times more likely to take their own lives than children with two parents. To those of you grappling with unbearable loss, know this, the overpowering grief that seems unbearable now can in time become bearable. There is life, happy, fulfilling life, after the suicide of a loved one. We offer ourselves as two examples. And we offer these thoughts from the perspective of two guys who have lived nearly 60 years since our mothers ended their lives. We so wish we could remember the sound of our mother's voices, but we'll never forget them or our good fortune to be standing on that street corner long ago. We said more than once, finding each other when we did may have saved us then, but it has most certainly sustained us since. Few of us make it through life without suffering some kind of traumatic loss. And that may be more true today in the throes of a pandemic than at any time in our lives. As many struggle against isolation, depression, and loss, calls to suicide hotlines have skyrocketed and psychologists fear dramatic increases in the number of suicides over the next several years. Today, a range of resources is available to help those in need deal with suicide and other kinds of traumatic loss. Many that didn't exist when we were the ones in need more than half a century ago. There are support groups and organizations that offer counseling and a safe haven to gather and get help. Organizations like the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the National Alliance for Grieving Children, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Some suicide loss survivors never talk about their anguish or they wait too long before they do. In silence, that pain weighs heavy on some more than others. A couple of years ago, my wife and I were at a dinner party with three other couples. The subject of the book David and I were just finishing came up and one of the other men casually mentioned that his father had died of suicide. And then our host suggested that once our book was published, people would come out of the woodwork with their stories. At the end of the evening, as our host was walking me to the door, he said, remember how I told you people would be coming out of the woodwork? Well, I'm one of them. My mother took her life when I was 18. My jaw dropped, I was shocked. Three of the four men at this dinner party 
or sons of suicide. Uh, this friend had not talked with anyone but his wife about his mother's suicide. But now he too realized he wasn't alone, that he could talk about it, at least with me. David, I'll never forget the day we discovered we were no longer alone. Ah, me either, Rick. One of those days that never fades from memory. When we met, I was living with Aunt Phyllis and Uncle Ben. Like it was yesterday, I can still see the tears on my aunt's cheeks when I told her about you and she realized that I'd finally found someone I could open up to. She knew immediately what we only came to understand years later. Opening up, confiding in someone you trust has the power to be the difference between becoming a prisoner of your own torment and escaping that torment. That someone could be a psychologist, a teacher, a member of the clergy, a support group, a relative, or if you are as fortunate as David and I were, a close friend. As we said at the start, everyone has a story. That's ours. Yes, that's ours so far.